Maurice Ravel was born in 1875 in a little village in southern France near the Spanish border. His father was Swiss and his mother was Basque. Ravel's devotion to his mother bordered on the obsessive, but it is from her that he developed his passion for Spanish music. Spanish composers have said that Ravel and Debussy have written better Spanish music than Spanish composers. And, and this is true. I mean, it's funny that those guys were able to write music from country that they had never, never even visited. Ravel loves Spain. Uh, for some reason, uh, some of the best Spanish music has been written by French composers. Chabrier certainly wrote some of it, and Ravel wrote quite a lot. And we needn't say anything more than Bolero. I believe Ravel was afraid that Bolero was going to be the piece that he was going to be remembered for. <laughs> um, it's an unusual piece. It's an unusual piece for today because it's one melodic line that just keeps repeating and there's really no development in it. What he changes is the orchestral color by adding different instruments each time the melody comes back. That must be the most, that's, that's like the easiest piece to conduct, a bolero, because actually it's, we're not even conducting. The real conductor in bolero is the snare drum. And uh, he's the one that really conducts. Because he's, from the first bar to the last bar of the bolero, the snare drum never stops playing. He plays dum, ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum, 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 ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum. And he is the most important musician in this piece. You need to give a rhythm. You, you have to start. That's it. The rest comes by itself. You just look at the flute player when they start. Once they hear that tune, the rest of it is all imitative. Don't think that it doesn't need a conductor. It has to be properly controlled. The climax can't come too early. The, the various portions of the orchestra have to be kept in the right balance. It's subtly done, despite the fact that the overt impression is an obvious one. And I think that uh, there isn't a better 20th century showpiece for spotlighting the individual solo instruments of the orchestra, too. Small wonder orchestras like to play it, they can show themselves off. The, the orchestration is the revolutionary thing, that somebody could take a melody and repeat it over and over and over and over again, and it would always sound new. The, the orchestration is, the, the musical substance of it is not a revolutionary. Uh, in contrary, it's extremely accessible. It's very, very easy to understand and listen to Bolero. That's a reason for its great success. That's why it's popular, because it's listenable music. It's like Muzak. It's like Elvis Presley. It's good. It's simple, straight out. Elvis was great. Elvis was just bingo right there, you know? No big deal. And the same thing here. Ravel is very straightforward. Bolero is very straightforward music. Nice tune. Ravel entered the Paris Conservatory at the age of 14 and stayed for 16 years. During a brief vacation in Saint-Jean-de-Luz in 1927,
he sat down behind a piano before a morning swim and played a melody with one finger. It was to be the theme for a ballet he had been commissioned to write. He entitled it Fandango, but soon renamed it Bolero. His new work was premiered at the Paris Opera in 1928 and was an immediate success with audiences. There was something incredibly colorful about the music. Ravel and Debussy as well wrote at a time when classical music was going through so many changes and tonality had all but exhausted itself, seemingly. And, um, and without Ravel and the music of the Impressionists, it, it's very hard to imagine where music would be today because all we would have then as far as taking tonality and moving it into something new and evolving it would be the neoclassicists, Stravinsky and these guys. To have had that impression of school, I think, gave, gave music so much of an expanded vocabulary of where tonality could go. Um, because, you know, in, in French music, in, in impressionistic music, a C dominant seventh chord doesn't go to F, it's just a wonderful color. You know, it, it can go anywhere it wants, really. It's completely coloristic. And so that freed up all the rules of tonality, so it didn't have to be so functional anymore. It didn't have to see going to F. It didn't have to have a purpose as much. Color in music is a difficult concept because it's a visual concept. What it means is if you play one note with one instrument and play the same note with a different instrument, you've got a different color, as we call it. it rel there are details that we could talk about in terms of the harmonic series and so on, but essentially that's what we're getting at. And uh, he had a sensitivity to the individual tone qualities of the instruments that was really extraordinarily refined. And so his orchestration is ex very vivid in terms of its color. Ravel once said about his most famous piece, Bolero is 17 minutes of orchestra without any music. Yeah, I think Bolero really started as a, it was a pure study for Ravel. He just really was trying to, to see how far he could go with, with, you know, one percussion going all the way through and adding instrument. And it's actually quite a perfect study. I mean, it's mind boggling to see that it goes for whatever, 15 minutes, and you have the exact same rhythm of the percussion, like an ostinato. And then he keeps adding and growing instrument. I think it's a really study of orchestration. Again, it's, it's pretty, for everybody, it's just a model. became synonymous with his name 
was hard for Ravel to bear because he felt it overshadowed his other, more important works. To call a Ravel a one-hit wonder with Bolero is ridiculous. That may be his greatest hit, but I mean, his, his piano concertos, uh, Daphnis and Chloe, the chamber music, that wonderful trio, the quartet, the, the pieces go on and on, and of all of that stuff, there's the enormous body of piano music. This man understood piano color as well as any composer of our century. And I think that to underestimate that music is really a sin. Ravel worked so hard at his pieces. He didn't write that many pieces, but the ones he wrote are so, so carefully done. And everything that's in there is a sound that he understood and worked at and listened and really researched. These strange harmonics and all these unusual combinations of sound. So for a conductor to really understand Ravel's music, you learn so much about the orchestra and about orchestration and about sound and this very special, transparent, very clear French sound. It's the best in Ravel. Ravel grew to hate Bolero. He didn't think it was his best work, and he never imagined in his wildest dreams it would become so popular. I sometimes think Ravel disliked Bolero as much as Rachmaninoff disliked his prelude in C-sharp minor. It became such an instant hit. Now, it's a simple Spanish dance um, with a triplet figure that gives a little variety to it. And I think that um, he thought he was writing a simple exercise in exhibiting orchestral tone color. And what he did, of course, was create the career for Bo Derrick and, and all these other people who w saw the simplicity of it and the hypnotic power of it. The movie 10, I think before that it wasn't sexy. <laughs> they just happened to land on the right combination. There's a difference between sexy and sensuous. I think comes it's more it's it's first it's it, it's first sensuous and then the sexy bit was was uh, interpretation of a filmmaker using this piece. Anything repetitive is not sensual. It's sensual before you know it. Sensuality to me is the moment before it happens. I think of I may. Um, as great lovemaking. Great lovemaking is the art of drawing it out as long as possible. I think it's very evident, and I mean, it's just, it's just you know, it's really a piece that can be very easily in a sexual or orgasmic piece. I mean, there's no question about it. I think you just feel it in your body. That music has an extraordinary sensual power to it. And the hypnotic repetition of the rhythm is part of it. Just following the progression as he goes through the orchestra to the wonderful climax, the big modulation toward the end is almost as though the world is opened. Ravel went into a deep funk around the same time the rest of the world did during the Great Depression of the 1930s. He felt he had failed as a composer for not having produced a larger body of work. He wrote about 35 major pieces, none longer than 50 minutes. He preferred smaller works rather than larger ones. In fact, his entire repertoire can be heard in a single day. Restless and unhappy, Ravel died in 1937 of complications following brain surgery. I think in a way he was a very sad man. I think he was never happy in his life. He never had any friends. He never had any relation that we know of, whether you know, as a woman or a man or anything. He didn't even have so many friends. He was terrible. He was a person really closed on himself that had a very big problem with to express himself, to speak with people, to go to people. He was not a social person at all. He was always reclosing his home. He had this little home where everything was organized and perfect, and he was just living there. I mean, he had a very, I think, a very strange and very sad life. But he also had an early sense of defeat. He tried three times for the Prix de Rome, the great competition for composers of that period, and three times failed. So he became um, a kind of independent person. He didn't follow all the standard r roads. He followed his own road. 
And I think that he was a very fastidious composer, a fastidious notesmith, and a very private person. Uh, but he was never really lionized until the late years of his life. So I wonder, I wonder if he had had earlier, bigger success, whether he would have been a more prolific composer, because he didn't write that many pieces. time in Paris for the, you know, 153rd time maybe the Bolero was being played in Paris yet again and Ravel was invited so he went there, he was sitting in his lodge and in those, in those days there was another composer called Camille Chevillard who never was very famous now but in those days he was famous. So Ravel had invited him to be his guest at the concert and the concert starts and Chevillard now doesn't show up and the Bolero starts five minutes, and ten minutes, twelve minutes, and Chevillard is not there, and, Bol and Ravel is really insulted. He said, you know, he could have been on time, that's really, really bad. And then about 30 seconds before the end of the piece, the door of his loge opens, and here comes Chevillard, he sits down, and the piece is finished, and everybody's clapping, and Ravel, you know, is acknowledging it, and, and finally he turns around, and he said, he said, really, Chevillard, said, you're really very impolite, you could have been at the beginning of the piece, and what happens to you? And Chevillard looked at him, he said, maître, he said, only came for the modulation. He took this one melody. At the beginning, it's stated very simply, and you can, you know, hear it very cleanly. And at each repeat, the orchestration changes, and it gets bigger. The momentum gets bigger and bigger, and it's this gigantic orgiastic piece. By the time you get to the final cadence.
the end of the piece, the entire audience jumps up and wants to applaud and, and scream because he's really done that to you by pacing the work the way that he did, oh so cleverly from the beginning all the way through to the last note. Ravel was happiest when he was engineering a piece of music with a clear, concise, intricate plan. He was a master of orchestration and a great painter of sound. And whether he likes it or not, Bolero will always remain one of the greatest Spanish compositions written by a Frenchman.